right, thank you. We got the mic on, ready to go. It's good to be with you tonight here at Westside. I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite a while. And it always strikes me when I come, and really a lot of places, different places that I may go, uh, how many common ties and connections there are, that if we had opportunity to talk about it, and who knows who and where, and it would be all kinds of overlap. Uh, if, what's that thing about six degrees and people knowing somebody all over the world? Well, I think in Churches of Christ, it's one or two degrees. Uh, we just have lots of connections. And uh, so I could start naming those tonight. Of course, we've got the Buxtons in common, who uh, built such a wonderful campus ministry here and have now done the same in Jonesboro. And I know you've kept that going here. And uh, Bill and uh, Margaret Grant, who are here, we see quite a bit of them with their family in Jonesboro, raise <laughs> One of my shepherds and a dear friend, and of course, Mita, Mita as well, a wonderful friend. Chris Harrell wanted me to pass on his apology for standing you up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he got sick and uh, couldn't make it, but uh, he, he wanted me to be sure and, and pass that, that apology on to you. So I know, um, I know you've had a, a wonderful summer planned, and uh, I know at some point I saw your list of speakers and people who were coming in to... To be with you this summer, and I kind of envy, envy that a little bit. I'd love to have had that lineup coming, uh, coming to Jonesboro, but it's still a little bit of potluck, right? I mean, you're here tonight, and this series has been planned, and you're thinking, is this guy going to have anything to say, and is it really worth coming for, and uh, you, you just kind of have to take what you get, and it sort of reminds me of a little story a friend of mine sent me the other day. I don't know if you've heard it or not about this lady who was expecting a child, and she was in an automobile accident, and she ended up in a coma for six months. But she's carrying a child, and, and the child is born before she comes out of her coma. And so she wakes up from her coma, and she realizes she's not carrying the child anymore, and she's asking about the child that was born. And, and they say, well, you not only had one child, you had twins. You had a boy, and you had a girl. And, uh, and your, your brother's here, and he's already named them for you. And she said, oh, no, my brother's an idiot. She said, there's no telling what. He's probably named them. And he said, well, let me tell you. He said, he named the girl Denise. And she said, well, that's not so bad. What did he name the boy? And he said, he named the boy the nephew. <laughs> <clears throat> so she didn't quite know what she was going to get, and you probably don't know what you're going to get. But uh, I'm glad to be here tonight, and I'm glad my wife, Ann, could come with me. Um, give us a little opportunity to be away, and so thank you for the opportunity to come tonight. I love your mission statement. I understand it is love people, make disciples, build community, and I like that. If you are a church on task with those three things, you are doing great kingdom work, so thank you for being focused on the things that really matter. And I suppose my part in the series uh, is to talk about discipleship. This is a dimension of discipleship that I'd like to share with you tonight. It seems to me that the focus of discipleship goes in cycles. And as I kind of look back over my life, I think when I started out, there, there was a very strong focus on knowing, on intellectual grasping of truth. Still important, right? We want to know what the Bible says. Um, but the primary way of being fed was with information. And, uh, and that does a lot for us. It really helps us to orient our thinking, to be able to think the thoughts of God, to know who God is. But there are deeper, deeper and other dimensions of human life besides just knowing facts. And, and, and all of us realize we can know facts about a lot of things and not really be transformed in the heart, right? I know some people who can play trivial pursuit with the Bible as well as anybody who don't really look a whole lot like Jesus. So we know there's more to discipleship than that. <clears throat> and so action is oftentimes one of those things that we think is really important. We need to plug in. We need to get busy. We need to get involved in church programs. We, we need to get involved in ministries. And sometimes we gauge the success of our discipleship ministry based on how many people are involved in the different programs of the church. <clears throat> and then there's been a real focus the last several years, <clears throat> excuse me, there's been a real focus the last several years on contemplative side of Christianity, uh, silence and meditation and solitude and uh, reflection. 
And I know that there's been times in my life where, where I was really hungry and starving for that. I remember in about 2006, I think it was, I, uh, I, I just felt like something was missing in my spiritual life. Maybe you've had seasons of life where you've been through, where you felt like you've been involved, you've been active, but you just kind of went through this season where you felt like you were going through the motions, but a little bit detached. Your heart's in one place, but you've had all this external focus of all these things you do and these things you study, and it's all in your head, but somehow you haven't fed your heart. And I felt that about that time. And so I decided I would try to to find some opportunities just to give some care to my soul. And I entered into kind of a year-long, um, it, it, was, it, it was called the Zoe Spiritual Growth, where you, you go, you read all these materials before you go, and then you go to a several-day retreat, and then you come back and you practice spiritual practices over a long period of time with a, with a spiritual advisor you touch base with every once in a while. And then toward the end of the year, you come back together for another retreat. But it's designed to help you begin to practice some of those things about solitude and meditation and silence and reflection and prayer, spiritual disciplines in your life. And I was starving for that at that point in my life. So there, there's different phases we go through. And, and some of us, I think, have personality bents that maybe we're fed a little bit more in one way than somebody else is fed a little bit more in the other. I think we need a, a balance of all of those things. And tonight, that's sort of what I'm going to talk about. But I want to talk with you tonight about practicing the ways of Jesus. And I want you to think about the practice, which is the doing. But the way I want to present it, it's sort of blended with this reflection, this blend of reflection and practice and reflection and practice. But I want to start out by talking about living and doing the will of Jesus. Um, because it seems to me that sometimes even though we may be active in church ministries, sometimes practicing the ways of Jesus is not exactly where our focus is. So there's, it's really a challenge to practice what we believe, right? I, I can identify with a preacher I, I read something about recently who got up to speak one Sunday and he made a disclaimer at the beginning of his sermon. He said, I have to tell you right up front that I'm a phony. phony. And then he said, it's terrible living with yourself after you give a good sermon. What he meant by that is, when you preach what you think is a really good sermon and you realize how far you fall short of actually being able to live the ideal you've proclaimed, it's kind of painful to be in that place. Maybe you've taught classes that way and you've thought, you know, I'm teaching what God says, but deep down I know I needed this really badly myself. Uh, he said he remembered one time he was up preaching and he was asking people, you know, about death. What do we have to fear of death? If we really believe that death is the beginning of life, what are we afraid of? It's not the end, it's only the beginning. And he said about that time he had a chest pain and he went into a panic within himself. You know, this could be a heart attack. So here he is preaching about not being afraid of death, but the first sign that something may be wrong and he goes into a panic. He had some people in his congregation, he'd been preaching there a long time, who were going to put together some thoughts that he had shared over the years and kind of compile them together in a book that we're going to call Through the Seasons of the Heart. And so they asked him to review some selections they'd come up with to put in the book from all the sermons he'd preached in the past. And they asked him to read over the manuscript to make sure that these were things he would really want in the book. And so he read over the manuscript and he thought to himself, you know, this is really good stuff. Why don't I practice this better? Can, can you relate to that, that if we did what we already know, it, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? But we all know that our performance and our knowledge don't always coincide exactly with each other. And I think the painful thing for us as ministers is because the primary way people see us is up in front of a church, preaching, proclaiming, saying what the will of God is. There's this subtle thing that happens in the minds of some people that think because we talk about it, well that we must do it well and so there's that realization that people oftentimes think of you as being better than you are because they hear you talk about such lofty thoughts well it's a common struggle for us all and maybe over the last several weeks you've seen some of the pew research on religion in america have, have you has anybody talked about that here um, i want to share just a real quick little thing about it in order to make a point but the Pew Research was on religious affiliation in America. 
um, most of the headlines that came in relation to it highlighted the demise of Christianity in America. Uh, there were all these headlines, these negative headlines that were going on. What it indicated was that from 2007 to 2014, the share of the population identifying as Christian in the United States declined 8%. 8% in seven years is pretty significant, wouldn't you say? That sounds pretty serious, and, and I, want to, I want to share a kind of a contrarian view of that without meaning to diminish the trend that is going on in our country at all. But Ed Stetzer says, in spite of those figures, Christianity in America is not collapsing. Instead, he says, it's being clarified. Churches aren't emptying, he said. In fact, a recent Gallup poll indicated the percentage of the U.S. population attending religious services is about the same as it was in the 1940s. But there, there, is, a downward, there is a trend that's, that doesn't look really good. But he says, churches are not emptying, rather those who have been Christian in name only are now categorically identifying their lack of Christian conviction and engagement. People whose religious affiliation is only in name only, those who check none on religious affiliation, they check that box, but he says these are the nominals becoming the nuns. These are people who weren't really practicing Christianity anyway, and now they're finally confessing it. He says Christianity is not collapsing, it's being clarified. And here, here's the statement I think is significant. He says the cultural cost of being a Christian outweighs the benefit, or as it does, as the cultural cost of being a Christian outweighs the benefit, more and more people are abandoning their affiliation. The middle is going away. Now this illustrates kind of what I want to say tonight. There are large numbers of people who professed affiliation for a long period of time without really practicing. So there are nominal Christians who have now decided they're not really Christian at all. But wouldn't we all agree that there's still many professing and attending Christians who fall into that same category of, press, of, of professing belief without really practicing their faith? Nominal Christians sit regularly in many of our pews, right? Maybe we go through seasons of life where that's descriptive of us. I know on some level that's a challenge for all of us. A comedian, Louis C.K., whom I know absolutely nothing about except I came across one of his quotes, he said in one of his comedy acts, may not sound really funny to us, but when he said it, I'm sure the crowd echoed with laughter. He said, I have a lot of beliefs and I live by none of them. That's just the way I am. They're just my beliefs. I just like believing them. I like that part. They're my little believies. They make me feel good about who I am, but if they get in the way of a thing I want, I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do anyway. So Christianity can have a way of becoming comfortable, and it can find a way for just settling into things like preference without conviction or belief without practice, or a part-time category of subset of life rather than a way of life. Or it shows up in our commitment to key indicators of discipleship, low priorities of time with God and His Word and prayer. Kind of says a little bit about where our heart is, doesn't it? A failure to give or to give generously says a lot about where our real commitments are. A failure to deal aggressively with behavior patterns we know are not of God, whether others are aware of them or not. If we're not aggressively seeking to deal with those things, doesn't that say something about how serious we are about practicing the ways of Jesus? Or seeing the church as a place to be served rather than a place to serve? Or a life shaped by everything but the way of Jesus, Jesus taking second place to other commitments and activities? profession and affiliation, but sometimes it doesn't seem to be making a big difference in how we steward our money or our time or our behaviors or our life. Affiliation and profession are one thing. Practicing the ways of Jesus as a way of life is another. I read about Arthur Burns recently, the chairman of the United States Federal Reserve System. He was an ambassador to West Germany. He was a man of considerable gravity. I mean, when Arthur Burns walked in the room, people had great respect for him. He was medium in height. He was distinguished looking. He had wavy silver hair. He had his signature pipe that he typically carried with him. 
He was an economic advisor to a number of presidents, from Dwight Eisenhower to Ronald Reagan. And when he spoke, his opinions carried weight, and Washington listened. Arthur Burns was Jewish. So when he began attending an informal White House Christian group for prayer and fellowship in the 1970s, he was accorded special respect. But they couldn't quite figure him out. What's this Jewish man doing in our Christian prayer and Bible study group? No one really knew what to do with him, and so when they had a prayer at the end of the meeting, and they typically passed it around and asked different people to pray, they never really asked him. They passed him over out of respect and reticence because they weren't really sure what to do with him. One week, however, the group was led by a newcomer who did not know the usual status that Burns occupied. So as the meeting ended, the newcomer, not knowing any better, turned to Arthur Burns and asked him to close the time with a prayer. Some of the old-timers kind of glanced at each other and winced a little bit at what was about to happen. But without missing a beat, Burns reached out, held hands with the other people in the circle, and prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, I pray that you would bring Jews to know Jesus Christ. And I pray you would bring Muslims to know Jesus Christ. And then he said, finally, Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. Because wearing the name as an affiliation or as a political stance or as a family heritage or as the place we happen to attend is not the same thing as practicing the ways of Jesus necessarily. I remember several years ago, we, we took the Reveal survey twice at Southwest. It's sort of an instrument to to see where your people are in their discipleship, kind of a measure, kind of establish a benchmark, see where your strengths, weaknesses are, try to address those things, come back, do it again later, and see if, see if you've made progress. It's been done probably now by over 2,000 churches around the United States. You can imagine what was learned about what helps in discipleship and what doesn't through that kind of survey. But one of the things they discovered after about a thousand churches had taken the survey was that being a part of a local church and being involved in the ministries and programs of that church do not necessarily lead to spiritual transformation. And so the measure we often use in a church is if we can get people to attend, if we can get them to involved in the ministries of the church and in the programs that we have, we measure that as success, right? Because we've got more people, we've got more bodies, we've got more involvement. But the survey showed that that in and of itself did not necessarily translate into spiritual transformation. And so what I want to suggest to you tonight is maybe, maybe in the midst, it's not saying those things are not without value. The ministries, the programs are good, but there's something else that needs to be happening. So if I were to ask you the question tonight, how would you define a disciple? I'm not going to ask you to say it out loud, but just think about it. How would you define a disciple? Tell you, I, I'm, I'm inter- you know, I want to know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. How would you define who a disciple is? And I want to suggest a text tonight. It's Luke chapter 6, verse 46 and 47. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? But listen to the next verse. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. I think those three things pretty well define who a disciple is. It's someone who comes to Jesus, listens for his word, and puts it into practice. So you can go to the Sermon on the Mount and study it and discuss it and process it as a class, knowing it, understanding it, talking about it, may not lead to spiritual transformation. The question is, What are we going to do this week to practice the ways of Jesus? Because the Sermon on the Mount is radical. It is a radically different life than the world around us. So what does it mean for you this week to actually love your enemy? What does it mean for you this week to not look lustfully? And we could repeat that question in many other ways. But what does it mean to practice the ways of Jesus? To come to Jesus, to listen to what he says, and to actually put it into practice. So, 
I want you to think about that for just a moment. Dallas Willard once said, to experience the kingdom of God, a group of people should get together and try to do the things Jesus taught. That's pretty simple, isn't it? A group of people should get together and just try to do what Jesus taught. So there's this realization that we don't enter the kingdom by talking about it or listening to one another talk about it. We have to experiment together on how to actually apply the words Jesus said to the life we get up and live tomorrow morning. And what difference is it going to make? Mark Scandretti, in his book, from where I borrowed my title for tonight, Practicing the Ways of Jesus, talks about the word dojo. I don't know if that's a word you're familiar with. I really wasn't. It's a Japanese word. It means a place of the way. It's a school of practice. They usually, usually, especially to talk about martial arts or meditation. So, but it could be for any skill or for any discipline that you want to do. But, but you, you know, if someone's going to learn to practice karate, you can't sit in a room and hear somebody lecture about it and learn to do it, right? You're going to have to actually practice, experiment with it, try it. It's going to feel very awkward at first. And sometimes responding to the ways of Jesus feels a little bit awkward at first. It doesn't feel natural for us. So we enter into this active learning environment where participation is invited and expected. So it's not just about information and ideas. Jesus said, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I think when he said, I'm the way, he didn't just mean the knowledge of me will show you the way. I think he meant you're invited to enter into the way. You're invited to join me on this path of living out this kingdom life. It's a discipleship model that says, follow me, surrender and practice, come follow me. It's it's an apprenticeship model. It's it's the way teaching was done in the first century, right? It it wasn't really done with our educational model of standing in a classroom. I mean, Jesus did stand before people and teach. But when he said, come follow me, literally he was saying, come follow me. Come follow me and watch what I do, imitate what I do, practice what I do. And as he discipled his disciples, you know what he would do? They they would go and they would watch and they would learn and then he'd send them out for them to do what they saw him doing. So they were apprenticing to Jesus. If someone wants to learn to be a carpenter, they find a good carpenter and they apprentice to him and they watch what he does and they try what he does. And then then he says, you you try it without me. And then then he leaves and comes back and sees how it's done. That's, that's, That's the apprenticeship model. It's how people learn trades even today. And it's how we learn to practice the ways of Jesus. So one of the things I'd like to encourage you with tonight is is this little chart that I'd like to to, to bring up for just a minute, a slide. Uh, You probably had no idea when I was going to ask for it. So Um, there are a lot of different, you'll see a lot of different uh, divisions of this, but you've probably heard the word kairos. It's the name of our church planting movement that we help sponsor at Southwest, but, but it's a Greek word that means time, but there's two words for time. There's chronos, which is chronological time, and there's kairos, which is sort of sacred moment time. One is about quantity and the passing of minutes. One is about this special moment in time, these kairos moments, these God moments that we experience. You've had them, right? And they've helped shape your life. These moments when you're more aware of God, when you're in tune with God, these special moments, these special opportunities that that you perceive to be of God. It seems to me that discipleship in some ways is increasing those moments. It's paying attention. It's being sensitive to the movement of God. It's being sensitive and aware of life as we're experiencing it in the presence of God. It's experiencing God in life together and creating this interaction and this dance between the life we live and the God we serve, following his lead as we seek to practice his ways. So this is, this is a way, I think, of seeing what that looks like. So you can look at the X on the line as you live out your life chronologically. Kairos is, is one moment on that time when you experience something in relation to God. So... Those moments in your life where you are facing a problem or you're involved with your family or you're trying to think about how to live out your faith on your job or you're thinking about a challenge you're facing today or you're facing about a hardship that you're experiencing and you're feeling discouraged and overwhelmed, 
Whatever that moment is, you have an opportunity to bring it into the presence of God and pretty much raise the question, what is God saying to me in the midst of this moment? I'm not talking about a still small voice or an audible voice at all. But as you reflect on who God is, of what you've learned about God, of how you've seen God work in the past, of the people that you've watched who are good examples of how to follow God, as you reflect on your moment, your situation, your challenge, your discouragement, your opportunity, whatever it is, you reflect on that in the presence of God. What do you hear God saying? Jesus said, the disciple is one who comes to me and hears my words. It's when we reflect on what God has revealed to us in the light of the situation we're in that these kairos moments begin to be created. We begin to view life in the midst of the presence of God. So as we reflect on that, what is it that God's saying to me? Then the next question becomes, how will I respond? What am I discerning God's will to be? What, how would Jesus shape what I'm facing today? What's on my to-do list? What the conversations I'm going to have or the people I'm going to meet? What is God saying to me and what am I going to do about it? How can that shape how I live today? And so really, your life is spent cycling through this continually, right? Where you experience these moments of life, and you ask, what's God saying to me in the midst of this moment? And as you begin to discern what that is, you say, well, what am I going to do about it? What are the next steps I'm going to take? And then you go out and you do that, and then you reflect on how that turned out. What did you learn from that? What did you learn about what you did well, what you didn't do? What, what would Jesus say? What are you hearing God say about that experience? And then as you reflect on that, you say, well, what am I going to do about it? What are the next steps to take? And you take them. And then what do you do? You create another moment to reflect on it. So it's, it's reflecting and doing, reflecting and doing, reflecting and doing. Listening to God, practicing the ways of Jesus. Listening to God, practicing the ways of Jesus. And it is in the process of listening and in the process of enacting that, that becomes the catalyst that begins to make all of the difference in the world. Because the kingdom of God is not received just by hearing what Jesus has to say. The kingdom of God is received by entering into it, actually beginning to live life in kingdom ways, actually beginning to participate in the kingdom of God. That's where real spiritual growth begins to happen. And when we consciously live a life of following after Jesus, what is he saying to me? How am I going to respond? What do I hear him saying in light of what I did? How am I going to respond? That, that cycle creates and increases those kairos moments where we can experience God in the midst of what he's trying to say to us and in the midst of how we follow him and see his life lived out among us. Um, it's interesting to me also when you uh, read the rest of that passage in Luke chapter 6. He begins to talk about the results of that. So he says, as for any, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. And it's interesting. So if, you, if you want to know this outcome, because they're like a man building his house who dug down deep and laid on a foundation of rock. That's who these people are like. People who live, who practice the ways of Jesus. This is what they're like. They've got this solid foundation. And then when the floods come and the torrents strike the house, they, it couldn't shake the house because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice, we all know this, right? This is the Vacation Bible School song. It's like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So we're all looking for a life that's well built, right? We're also all looking for a life that's on a firm foundation. We, we believe that God is building us into something solid and significant. We want our people, our church, our family, our brothers and sisters, our fellow Christians, we want them in this transformation process that builds this solid relationship with God that can withstand whatever may bring in the future. And so it seems to me he's saying there is a special grace available for people who practice the ways of Jesus. And that this special grace doesn't just come from hearing and understanding. 
it comes from it being so saturated into our life that it becomes how we live and what we do. So, so many people misunderstand grace in the kingdom of God. You know, grace is a marvelous gift from God, and we usually think about it with reference to salvation, right? We think about God's marvelous grace, that we, we deserved punishment because we're sinners, but God gave us what we needed instead of what we deserved. And that is a beautiful, wonderful gift, and that is a part of what grace is. But grace is not just limited to whether we're lost or whether we're saved, and we so short-circuit the power of the gospel and the significance of the kingdom of God to reduce it to only that. Because as strange as it may sound, being saved from the consequences of our sin is not the bottom line of why Jesus came into the world. That's a means to an end. God wants to establish his kingdom, and he wants to do it through us. And so grace takes our sins away, opens our life to God, so that now he can begin to do his sanctifying work with us through his spirit, so that the kingdom of God really is established among us and within us in the life that we live. We're living into the reign of God. God rules and God reigns, and our life becomes his way. So grace is not so much, it's not just a free pass to salvation, which is how we typically look at it. Grace is a circle of life we enter into and participate in. And when we radically follow Jesus, we participate in his kingdom way. We follow him in kingdom living. Now, let's change the analogy just a minute in order to illustrate the point. Let's imagine we're talking about it in reference to a concert, okay? Grace is not just a free pass to the concert. Grace is instead a gracious opportunity to join the band. That's different, right? Grace is not just a free gift to attend the concert. What if grace is an opportunity to join the band? It is to follow the lead of the star at center stage and to harmonize with him in the beautiful music he's making. We may not play perfectly, but we are moved to play. And in his state of grace, we're caught up in the music of his life. It is not grace to watch the show. It is grace to join the concert. It is grace to be a part of the reign of God on the earth. So listen, returning to the enduring reward of following Jesus, it is not just the initial free invitation of grace that sustains us. It is our participation in God's gracious kingdom life that sustains us. It is the foundation of hearing and doing upon which Jesus builds. It is, the right of, it is the way of right and truth and Jesus, and it will withstand the onslaughts of life. So here's what he's saying in this passage. When we live a life of hearing and doing, we enter into a special state of grace that sustains and endures because we are entering into the very powerful dynamic of the kingdom of God itself, and Satan and all his armies cannot hold it back. The book of Revelation even says... These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. It is in entering into the rule and reign of God that we share in His victory. So when temptation comes, He's saying there's grace to sustain in that temptation. When hard times seem to be overwhelming, there's grace for those who hear and do. When the culture makes it more difficult than beneficial to be a Christian, There's special grace and strength for those who come and hear and put into practice. And when the end of life and judgment comes, as participants in the kingdom of God, we we still stand no matter what else happens. It is the promise that someday God will intervene, life on earth will cease, and this earth will be burned up, and heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not pass away. But those who hear and do his word will stand, for he is able to make us stand. Everything else will pass away. The foundation of hearing and doing is firm. It is the life in the way of God. And when everything else passes away, those who participate in the kingdom of God will stand. Because we have entered into that circle of life, that practicing, living, breathing circle of life where God reigns. So I'm hoping tonight that while there's been nothing said that's profound, probably nothing you didn't really already know, 
just the reminder that this focused Christian life on hearing and doing kind of cuts through all the religiosity of, that goes with doing church and reminds us to come back to what is central and core, coming to Jesus, hearing what he says, and actually putting it into practice. And God works powerfully in the midst of exactly that. Let's close with a prayer.